room. Anybody feel a pressing need to make a comment? I'm going to come to you in a minute. Any, qu any comments, first of all? Mala, Nagesh, I think I saw Naveed at the back. I saw, uh, let's see, who else? Anybody else wants to make a comment? Don't try to do a comment and then have to Okay, then you can go ahead. <laughs> now you get permission. <laughs> yeah. um, excellent panel. Uh, uh, learned a lot. Uh, one of the subjects I think uh, I didn't hear directly was uh, corporate politics. Yeah. And I, I do think it's an important subject. And uh, the way I define corporate politics in terms of what I call EBI factor, egos and vested interests. And um, so uh, I, I really believe that people who are good at that, in managing egos and vested interests, do have an advantage over others in uh, going up the corporate ladder. And besides, all the other factors are important. So, so that's kind of the comment. I'd like to now ask uh, the panel, uh, how do you manage EBI factor in a corporation? Did that really help in going, growing up the corporate level? So I'll go first, actually. So I don't deny there's politics in companies, but I don't necessarily think it's bad. I think you just got to understand it. And I think that's why I mentioned this notion of EQ, to understand and to empathize with who's operating and what. Occasionally you find somebody who's operating in a very sort of uh, dirty way where there's nothing to gain, they don't have anything to gain, they're just holding on to something. But most people have got some vested interests, as you say, and you know what they are looking to gain from that particular uh, situation that they're holding on to. So I think it's a question of learning to identify and understand what they were all about, to really pay attention to yourself and attention to them, to be aware of it and to network like crazy. I think networking solves a lot of these political problems. Uh, okay, I you know it's a very uh, important subject because it happens. And to me, there are three flavors of politics in a corporate environment. The first one is called the control of the resources. You want to be able to control more people, more money, more allocations in your own way as you feel fit. That is number one. Number two is called favoritism. You like a certain person, you want to push that person's cause, give them more pushy jobs, more juicy jobs, whatever have you. So favoritism is, a, is the uh, second uh, variety of politics, uh, nepotism, you know, I, that, you know, in, in interpersonal kind of stuff. And the third one is, I think, uh, lying and cheating and telling stories and creating, fabricating stuff and, you know, creating all sort of perceptions that are not necessarily true. And some people might do that. The third one doesn't last long because people figure it out. Figure it out. Uh, and nepotism and favoritism also along the way gets diluted. But the fundamental point is for a person not to play any of the politics. That, is, that has been my principle. But be sharp. You know what's going on. Exactly. If you're aware of the political scenarios around you, you will adjust your behavior and your secure position accordingly. That's the way I have operated. But be aware that those three kinds of politics are real. They exist in different degrees and magnitudes at different times and places on this human earth. I absolutely agree, and uh, one corollary, corollary, corollary is uh, uh, as the company gets bigger, it gets pretty close to a government. I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, Fujitsu, I work for 200,000 people. The top of Fujitsu and top of a small country is all the same, you know, amount of money they deal with, allocation of resources. And, and so, in a way, uh, some of politics is not necessarily bad. Because in a big company, also we touched on, is of being only profit motivated. The other motivated of control of resources and other things coming. Because most probably uh, power and ego, right? Yeah, power and ego, right? So, uh, uh, but big companies have that feature, and being aware of it is good. Uh, I think if you there are different leadership styles, and if your leadership style basically is that the mission of the company. So there are levels of this called six areas of leadership. The top one is 
always be aware of the what the company the institution wants to wants to be able to achieve right then you kind of stay away from the politics because you're not caught by to please your boss to make this quarter or, or or to play you know games so i think if you take the long long view and you say i do want to work for this company uh, uh, i think uh, you're in safe hands Yeah, I just wanted to disabuse this notion of politics inside an organization um, because any time an organization has more than two people, there's going to be politics. This is just the social nature of an organization. But if you look at where do the word comes from, politic means shrewd. That's the origin of the word. So in my experience, myself and working with so many people as my clients, performance trumps politics always in, 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 exactly. a, in a disparaging sense. I don't mean in a politics sense. But when I tell you the origin of the word politic, which is shrewd, you must be shrewd in how you conduct yourself inside an organization, regardless of how well performing you are. So you can't subordinate that to your intellect by saying, I'm so smart. I can screw this guy or whatever, right? You can't do that. So my guidance is be aware of the surrounding or ambient politics, but always focus on performance because eventually performance trumps. And if you are in an organization where the performance betrays you because of politics, it's on your resume and you can go outside somewhere else and perform the way you want to perform. So don't subordinate yourself dirty politics, understand its nature, and learn how to play to your advantage in a good sense. And if you can master that, I think that if you perform well, you will really climb high on the ladder. I'll just make a brief comment. You know, the information technology industry, IT, right, information, in my opinion, the two phrases that I think really talk about the, the makeup of a person is integrity and trust. You know, you are the company that you keep. You know, there are a lot of people in an organization that are not that fun. You know, I personally avoided those guys, but let me give you an example. You know, all of us have hot buttons on our chest. I can guarantee you, your spouse or your friend or your partner can press that in one nanosecond. You can try it with any of your, you know, the, your loved ones, right? So how you approach people is the most important thing. If you take the high road of having that feeling of integrity and trust that, you know, give the benefit of the doubt to the person saying, Hey, they're making a point, I really want to understand and have that awareness. And making sure you really build that ecosystem of goodwill and feeling. They, people will go out of their way to be helpful because they know that your only interest is delivering at a high performance level for the good of the company. You're keeping the customer at the center of the table and delivering to that success. So have that integrity and trust because it's the same values you have at home with your children or your loved ones. You're just bringing that into the workplace on a daily level. Thanks, Vivek. I don't want to belabor the point, but I'll leave you with one thing on politics. Is at least my style was I would never take it on head on. I would always come up from the flank where they're least expecting it. And that's because I've understood what they're really politicking about, what their real goal is, and to look at ways in which by doing what I'm doing, I can also solve some of their goals. So that's why I use the word networking loosely. But networking is about being friends with some of the people who politic the most. Yeah. Let's go to questions. Those of you who've got questions, please. Yeah, go ahead. With Hello. those, wait for the mic, please, and then let me point to you. Hello, so um, my question is that I'm sure in your long careers you would have changed uh, uh, not just functions, within the same industry, but maybe even industries because things are changing and so on. And especially uh, in this context where the comments were made that you know, nowadays people look for what we have just walked on the right wheel, not to hire the person on the right wheel or something like that. But really it's the, the field, there's more specialization that's wanted, but still things are changing so much that there is a desire to go from one, there are skills to be taken, but also a desire to go from one industry to the other. What advice would you have uh, for people in this today's environment, to be able to change industries, how to approach that. Um, there were a few things that I mentioned, just would like to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, I can take that. 
Um, it's not as hard as you think it is. If you are working at a very hands-on individual contributor level, it's probably very difficult. If you, if you are a Java, Java, Java expert and if you want to do flex, you just don't have that skill. But as you move up, what you must learn, and I've done this so many times with my clients that I can say with confidence that it's very doable and I've done it, even for myself, is that you need to find a pivot around value that they are looking for, but they haven't seen it. Let me give you an example. Let's say that they say we want the following um, skill set. And you look at the job, you look at what the company is doing, and you look at what skill sets you bring, and you make a case where you say to the hiring manager's boss, not the hiring manager, but the hiring manager's boss, two levels above, and say, I've researched your company, I've researched your competition, I've seen how the market is going, the direction. Here are three things you need to do to stay ahead of the competition, right? And here is what I can do for you. Now you've taken a point where you've given them something to think about that they haven't thought about. And I'll tell you an actual story. I have a client who came out of EMC, was laid off in uh, 2009 at the director level. He was in storage. He came to me, couldn't find a job, market was really bad. And he said, Dilla, I've had a job for three, I've been out for three months, I must get a job, I'm willing to go even as a manager. I said, if you want to go down as a manager one level, you don't need me. You can do that on your own. But if you want to go up as a senior director, I can help you. He said, I was laid off as a director. I said, it doesn't matter. So what we did was we researched the storage industry, and we wrote three letters to this very high-level people, one to Cisco, one to Citrix, and one to Hitachi Data Systems, that this is what is happening in the industry. This is what I think you should do with your product portfolio, and I can show you how to do it. He had researched it, I helped him write the letter. And turns out Cisco was not hiring at the time. Citrix said, can you wait three months because we have hiring freeze and so forth. But Hitachi Data Systems, his SVP called him and said, you know, this is a very interesting idea. I would like to talk to you about it. And at less than six weeks, six weeks later, he was hired as a senior director, shepherding exactly what Nagesh was saying, shepherding what they didn't think about that he had suggested that he could do well for them. So the point I want to make is, anybody can do this. Anybody can do this. In fact, in my first book on page 292, I remember the page number, we wrote a letter to Steve Jobs in 2001 when Apple was laying off. Client came to me and said, Dilip, this G4, I can figure out how to maintain it much better. So we, he showed me how to do it. So we wrote a letter to Steve Jobs. And the next day, sent it FedEx, it's a true story. The next day, his secretary called and said, Mr. Jobs has read you a letter, and he wants to talk to you. He's talking to my client. So point I want to make is this. There are so many opportunities that we don't see because we're just responding to a job that's posted. But if you look at the whole view where the company is, where the competition is, what skills you bring that are not apparent from the job description, it opens up a whole bunch of things that you can't think about. I mean, beyond what you can think about. And I've done this many times. Uh, I, I think all yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, just following up on that, right? So the way I say it is unique, Y O U, unique, right? And so what you have to do is you've got to change your industry. You've got to give something which is unique in the sense you make it unique, and therefore they will go after that, right? So if it's not a fit, it's got to be uniqueness. Question. So, uh, Vic, you mentioned a point that it's important to have a mentor as you're moving up, and that is something I've heard over and over. So my question to you and to the panel, how does one go about getting a mentor? Have any one of you had mentors throughout your careers? Have you had mentees? How did those relationships develop? Because it seems like when you have a relationship, it needs to be uh, productive for both parties. What can we do, you know, as potential mentees to, you know, so that it is a mutually beneficial relationship. So yes, as I explained earlier, you know, I, I realized early in my career that uh, you know, me moving up in that big corporation, I really needed some help and guidance. 
And so I absolutely got a mentor. I just lucked out that he was employee number five at Compaq and was one of the founders. But you need to look for that mentor within the company, right? So you need to do your homework and say, you know, who's the kind of leader, whether if you're a manager, it should be a director level or a vice president would be even better. So do your homework and figure out who you can have that rapport with. And so you need to, you know, meet with three or four people. Like I said, take them out to lunch and have a conversation about, you know, what, how they achieve their success, what you're interested in. And, you know, I have uh, I've a number of friends that I've suggested this to, and it's worked every time. And what you bring to the table was what, you know, Dilip and Farhat and all were saying, is that you're going to bring to the table that says, look, I understand where this company is going. I believe that there are some opportunities that we should consider. So it's a two-way street that you're bringing your intellectual firepower to that conversation. And, you know, most senior people are delighted to mentor younger people in their own company because they were in your position at some point in their career. And they want to help you get to that next level. So... But do your homework first and figure out who you feel that connection with. And I think the one thing I'll add is the worst thing the mentee can do is to come to a meeting unprepared. Where they've not done that homework. Where they meet you for the first time, you've exchanged niceties, you know each other's background, and then you don't know what to do. Or you give me some, you know, mentees asking the mentor, give me some ideas. We, Vishen, I see it a lot in entrepreneurship. I want to start a company, can you tell me what to start? <laughs> uh, I, if I knew what to start, I'd start it myself, you know? <laughs> so I'm trying to listen to what you want to start. So you really need to think about what you're getting mentorship for. There are different types of mentors. The best type is somebody that belongs inside your company because they will know the, you know, the nuances of the company, they know even some of the personalities that helps best. Second best is if you don't have somebody in the company, look for somebody who's seen other companies like your company so that they understand the industry. And if you're in entrepreneurship, you look for somebody who can help you think through a business plan, think through a strategy, think through what you need to form your team. But you've got to think about what you're looking for mentorship for. I think that's a very key part. I'll give you some suggestions.